Good afternoon. Welcome to this McGraw-Hill Education Webinar, Effectively Using Digital Content in the Social Studies Classroom. I'm Michelle O'Brien with McGraw-Hill Education, and I will be the webinar moderator for today's session. Before we get started, I'd like to mention one housekeeping item. This webinar is being presented in listen-only mode, which means you'll be able to hear the presenters, but they won't be able to hear you. However, that doesn't mean you can't participate. We, of course, want to hear any questions you have, so please just type those in the question panel on your toolbar. Joining us today are our presenters, Tom DeCord and Justin Reich. Tom is director and co-founder of EdTech Teacher, an educational technology speaker, instructor, and author. Tom has worked with schools, districts, colleges, and educational organizations in the United States, Canada, Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. He has presented on educational technology topics at national and international conferences, and his articles on educational technology have appeared in various educational publications, such as eSchool News and Daily Genius. Justin Reich is an educational researcher interested in the future of learning in a networked world. He is the executive director of the PK-12 initiative at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, a research scientist in the MIT Office of Digital Learning, and a lecturer in the Scheller Teacher Education Program. He is also a fellow at the Berkman Center for Internet and Society and is the co-founder of EdTech Teacher, a professional learning consultancy devoted to helping teachers leverage technology to create student-centered, inquiry-based learning environments. Thank you all for joining us today. At this time, I'm going to give the control over to our presenters. Terrific, I think we're all set to start. Tom, you can take it away. Thanks, Justin. So good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us. So I'm, I'm Tom DeCourt, and uh, just briefly, my background in history and social studies, I taught high school history. Um, I taught for 15 years. I taught a few years in Europe after college. I taught American international schools overseas. I taught in my native Quebec. I was born and raised in Montreal, taught in my high school. Been in the Boston area here now for about 18 years and became a U.S. citizen about 10 years ago. I uh, taught for 10 years at an independent school outside of the Boston area, and they purchased uh, laptops in 1999, and for seven years, students would come into my class and grab a laptop out of the cart, and off we would go. And as you might imagine, back in 2000, when I started this program, one-to-one uh, -one was not something that people were generally aware of. There were very few laptop programs, and hey, made uh, plenty of errors along the way, but uh, started to, do, to uh, gather some resources, develop some instructional strategies, and then eventually a, a paradigm or framework for technology integration. Okay, great. Justin, if you could move the next slide. Thank you. So when we work with various schools and districts and uh, we're engaged with teachers, on-site workshops, online learning, whatever that might be, we start with a fundamental question. You know, what is it that you want students to be able to do? The most important part of technology integration is that it's aligned with learning goals. In other words, if we are able to identify and communicate agreed upon learning goals, goals such as getting to know our students better, so goals such as making their thinking visible, goals such as reaching all learners by diversifying our instructional methods. If we can coalesce around learning goals, then we can start to identify some tools and strategies that align with those goals. When we start to look at technology as a separate entity, when it appears to be distinct from learning goals and not in supportive of what teachers wish to accomplish, it's more likely seen as an add-on. It's more likely seen as something else for us to do. When we see it as something that's aligned with our goals, that will help us achieve their goals, that's in the best interest of the students, we're less likely to see it as some sort of separate entity or add-on, but something that's useful, even beneficial for us in achieving worthwhile learning goals. All right, Justin, next slide. 
one overall framework or concept that we introduce and we will extrapolate with uh, teachers and schools, uh, administrators, is the desire and really the need to nurture creative learning environments in our interconnected, globalized, fast-paced, and problem-laden world. We need to develop citizens who are able to tackle pressing problems, often problems uh, where there may be no foundation or where there may be no, uh, no data or even research available on that particular problem. Can they be adapt adaptive and then can they create innovative solutions to problems? Can they address tasks and prompts from us? as educators that require them to develop approaches that essentially will help them nurture some of the competencies and skills that will belie an effective citizenry. And so one of our principal goals is to try to develop those creative learning environments. So one framework that we introduce and integrate in many of the workshops and in uh, many of the things that we do with teachers is the CRCD or Collect, Relate, Create, Donate framework. This framework was developed by Ben Schneiderman. He's a professor at the University of Maryland and he writes and speaks uh, on e-learning, the intersection between technologies and of course human behavior and uh, human learning. So he has, pro uh, he has proposed a framework that we find that integrates quite well in the development of beneficial tech integration activities. Um, going through this spectrum, the collect, uh, the collect aspect or collect phase, if you will, briefly would be developing research skills, and of course that's highly applicable to history, developing res research skills so that kids are able to effectively to uncover and use inform information in various resources, whether that be digital or print. They'll be effective in addressing historical problems and uh, tasks. The relate phase has to do with collaboration, the ability to work with others in tackling problems and tackling challenges, addressing historical issues. Uh, create is really the foundation, learning to create or creating to learn, is how can we put students in creative environments where they can use multiple modalities to demonstrate what they know, think, feel, and understand. At its heart, if we're able to provide students with an opportunity to express themselves using different modalities, be it text, images, audio, video, animation, some combination thereof, there's a better chance that we will better understand and appreciate their learning and ultimately give every learner a chance to excel. The last is donate, and the donate framework here is how can we how can we take what students have created and use it for an authentic audience that might benefit from it. So one example of that would be student created content that's distributed to perhaps other sections of a history class, and so other students within that course could benefit from that creation and that knowledge. It might even be disseminated distributed throughout the school, throughout a district. And in many cases today, of course, with the internet, you're seeing student projects that are being distributed, being published internationally. So why creativity? Well, one, of course, is it's reflective of higher order thinking. Bloom's taxonomy has, of course, has influenced pedagogy and influence the way that we approach curricular content in this country. And we know that in history, to uh, the ultimate goal is for our students to do history. Now they need to begin by knowing history. They need to remember certain names, certain, uh, certain events, certain, uh, 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 certain concepts. But essentially what we want to do is move them up through this spectrum of thinking skills to a point where they're able to take base knowledge and then be able to create something fundamentally novel or new. Not an easy task, but the creation of educational content, which, which has its out as its foundation, 
these uh, lower level skills is a great indication uh, that students have not only understood but actually mastered curriculum content to the extent that they can create a new product out of it. So that's one of our, one of our uh, principal goals. So I wanted to show you an example. Um, I'll just preview it and then Justin will play a couple of minutes from this. Um, this is from a public high school class in Chicago. Sean McCusker has been teaching for about 18 years, uh, sorry, 20 years and 18 of those in a public school. The last couple he's been in, uh, in an independent school. And in his public school, uh, they purchased iPads and Sean asked a fundamental question. What could students do with the iPads? Notice he didn't ask, how can I teach with the iPads? Because that brings up a whole, that, 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 that infers a different paradigm. If, if we come with, how can I teach with technology, often we're thinking about technology in the hands of the educator, the hands of the teacher. And often that technology is used to disseminate or distribute content. And there's some measure of passive uh, receptivity by the students. When you start thinking about what students can create, now it infers that students are more at the center of the learning process, that they are using technology as tools to create and then ultimately share and perhaps publish this educational content. So the story behind this is that um, Sean, for years, had an industrial philosopher's project. So kids would write formal analytical essays. And Sean decided with the iPads now in his classroom, he was going to afford the kids an opportunity to demonstrate what they know in these different modalities. So kids would approach Sean and say, hey, I'd like to be able to demonstrate what I know about the industrial philosophers in this way. And so when it came to the time where kids had to turn in or present their project, this, this particular junior, this girl, whose video we'll see in a moment, was so shy that she put up her hand and said she had to go to the bathroom. And hey, this is a 13 minute video and she came back 14 minutes later. And then they played the video. Let's play a little bit and get a sense of what she actually created. Adam Smith versus Karl Marx. This could quickly turn into a debate between the ideas of capitalism and the ideas of socialism, or the ideas of capitalism and the radical version of socialism, Marxism or even could turn into a debate between capitalism and communism, which derived from Marxism. Although these philosophers vary greatly in their ideas and philosophies, without them the Industrial Revolution would not have been what it is, and it would not have the effect today without them. Adam Smith Adam Smith was born on June 17, 1723 in Scotland. He was a professor at the University of Glasgow, and he wrote the book The Wealth of Nations. In this book, he defended the ideas of a free market, free economy, and the three natural laws. Smith was a firm believer in laissez-faire economics, and he also thought that economic liberty would result in economic progress. At the core of Adam Smith's laissez-faire capitalist philosophies lies the three natural laws of economics. Law one is the law of self-interest. Law number two is the law of competition. And law number three is the law of supply and demand. Law number one of Smith's natural laws is the law of self-interest. This question is asked almost every day by most people around the world. The question is, why work? Why spend 8 to 12 hours every day working? The answer for most people is you or your family. Why do you go to school? To get an education which will most likely lead to a better life with more money, more food, and more luxuries such as vacations, electronics, and a better house for you and your family. Law number two of Smith's Natural Laws is the Law of Competition. A small family-owned shop opens up on a street with some other surrounding small shops around it. Unlike the other shops, this one sells dressers. We will call this store, store number one. Store one has one worker, and they can make one dresser in the average of three months. So in January, a customer comes and takes away the dresser. Another customer comes and they order another dresser. And 
in April, the customer comes back and takes their dresser that they ordered. Business is going great for store number one. However, in May, another store selling the same dressers opens up just down the street. We will call this store, store number two. In July, store number two releases a dresser while store number one is still out of stock. Store number two continues to make dressers, and instead of waiting, one customer comes and takes them all at once. This causes store number one to make a better product. This causes store number two to make a better product, and they keep enhancing their products as the need for business increases. This turns into something like a game for the businesses. One store releases the product, the next store talks that, and the next store talks that. The more businesses there are, the more competition is created. Ultimately, this competition creates a better product. Okay, Justin, if you could stop it there. On number three, I'll... Thanks so much. So, dare say she knows her content, doesn't she? And she can communicate it wonderfully. So when she comes back into the room, all the students turn around and just give her a rousing round of, uh, round of applause. And as Sean told me, he had no idea. So he had no idea what this student was capable of. In class, she was just painfully shy. She would just not, she would not talk. In the writing, hey, the mechanics were strong, but he never anticipated this kind of ingenuity and this effective communication of curriculum content. So what happened is Sean asked her, he said, look, I've got a YouTube channel. Do you mind if I post it on my YouTube channel? She says, sure, fine. So post it, she gets hundreds of hits, and then it turns into thousands of hits. So she comes to Sean and she says, hey, can I work on that project some more? I mean, think how often kids actually come up to us and say, hey, can I work on that essay some more? You know? <laughs> so um, Sean says, of course, of course you can work on it some more. And she works on it and republishes it. So the long and short is if you go to Google right now and you search Adam Smith Karl Marx, uh, guess who comes up first? Or if she's not first, she's in the top three. So her hits, I, last time I looked, were over 90,000 hits. She is arguably the most popular resource for Adam Smith and Karl Marx on the web right now. So there's some intangibles of this. When you create opportunities for students to excel, by, diversity, by basically diversifying your instructional methods, you have an opportunity to create a situation where students really take ownership, really care, and are generally motivated and excited about what, they've, what they have accomplished. Um, I, I would say there's no doubt that she will remember this project the rest of her life. What you now see in front of you, this is part of a project that I did years ago with my US History Survey course. Um, for years, I had been teaching the, the New Deal, the New Deal, without a tremendous amount of success, partly because kids saw some sort of disconnect, or maybe it was just too abstract, between the sort of federal uh, legislative policies, that uh, the alphabet soup that makes up the New Deal, and uh, ultimately the impact on American citizens. So I tried a somewhat different approach one year. I asked students to research what it was like to be a teenage hobo. So they used the New Deal Network, Resources Library of Congress, even some PBS resources, read stories about kids. Then I asked them to create a story of what it was like a day in the life of a hobo. So this really is an interdisciplinary creative writing type assignment, but that needs historical foundation and hence historical authenticity. So I had kids writing stories when they were talking about bulls and, and mulligan stew. And they were sort of using, um, using the sort of these appropriate terms. They were, some of them were writing in the vernacular of the period that kind of amazed me. And many of them wrote touching stories. So one was written by a 15-year-old girl who wrote this story about her family in Kansas and the impact of the Great Depression on her father, both financially but also psychologically, emotionally how it kind of destroyed the family in many ways. And he finally told his daughter, the girl who's writing the story, that he had to send her away. And he was going to send her away to California, and she was going to spend time with Aunt Sarah. And so she talks about her experience with bulls and riding the rails and mulligan stew and all of this. And you read it, and you're so impressed by the historical authenticity that she was able to create a whole new novel educational content out of a firm understanding about how the Great, Dep uh, the Great Depression impacted citizens. 
So um, one thing I decided to do is I decided to interview these kids in character. It kind of dawned on me that the 1930s was the golden age of radio. So this would be a perfect time to do a podcast. So I had the kids come up, interview them in character, and what we did is we put these interviews together and I added an introduction, I added some music, some jazz music of that era, and we simulated a radio show. And I can remember when I played the radio show in front of the kids, um, some of the students were literally bouncing off their seats. I'd never seen them so excited and so nervous when they were listening to the show. So we'll play a little excerpt, Justin, if you could sort of move to the one minute mark, I'm interviewing one of these students. Originally from Little Rock, Kansas, but um, a few years ago, that my pop pop lost his job um, with the electrical company, so we had to move to Hooverville in Ohio. And and how was that experience living in the Hooverville in Ohio? Well, we didn't really expect much, I guess, because it's a shanty town and all. But we got there, and uh, we didn't really have anything to start with. We had to go around and sort of make a house for ourselves out of you know the trash and cardboard. And, metal and everything we could find around and it really wasn't much to replace the house that we left behind in Little Rock. Oh, those are trying circumstances. Huh? Uh, how did that make you feel living in such squalid conditions? Well, it, it was really tough because my family also had to see a lot of uh, my younger brothers and sisters. And so my twin brother and I decided that we were going to try to leave and go out west and try to help our family by being one, you know, a couple months left and out to see. So, we headed out on the rails and didn't really know where we were going, but just decided that we were going to try to find something better for us. Were there I just, if you could stop it right there, thank you. Well, actually, it was really tough because we met this boy, Bobby. I remember I was sitting there listening to her, and um, essentially I was stunned. I mean, here, here was a student, like a really capable student, but I always got the sense uh, with well, many of the kids, it's like, hey, Mr. DeCord, tell me what I need to know for the test. Tell me what I need to write for the essay. And some of these kids got, were completely transformed by this assignment. I was somebody looking at them as like, who took over your body? Because I do not recognize you. And they really got into this performance and were able, you know, sit there without notes and to really create an authentic experience and content as a teenage hobo, I was just really really impressed with them. And some of the, you know, some of the students who excelled in this assignment were some of the students who couldn't communicate their knowledge of this content as effectively in the analytical essays that I had them write regularly. So by creating these periodic opportunities where kids could have expressed themselves in. Um, in these different environments, these different modalities, I uh, created, created environments where I got to know these kids better. I got to understand them better. I got to realize, hey, you know, this really, really tremendous artistic potential with this student. Hey, tremendous performer here. Hey, does great work with visual communication. Wow, look at that video editing and the ability to, com to communicate a very powerful, strong message ab about a topic. So, by, by, by hopefully having a better rounded instructional activity framework and by diversifying these, you know, diversifying these different modalities, I, I, I think I was able to reach, um, reach some learners who I might not have reached. Keep in mind, uh, Sean and I, uh, we're both sticklers for grammar, both, both sticklers for effective traditional communication through prose. Um, you know, the kids would tell you I take I take points off for spelling and grammar errors. Um, they wrote a tremendous amount in my class. But um, I also looked at it and I said, what other skills and competencies do I need to develop that will prepare them for the eventualities as, as a global citizen? So uh, that's why a project like this, while periodic, to me was very, very important. Uh, one last point is um, I know in reunions, when I would go to reunions and kids would come come and, and walk over to me, one of the things they would often ask is, hey, are you still doing the hobo project? And a few would volunteer, hey, that's about the only thing I can remember from your class. I taught, you know, I taught U.S. History Survey, AP for years, world history, and often it felt like a march through the content and was the proverbial, hey, mile wide, inch deep. And I'd ask myself, what do kids really remember? 
and it's like, hey, I had kids, you know, did, did pretty well in the AP exam or did pretty well in some sort of formal assessment. But I was also, also, I was also asking myself, did, did, did the learning last? And in these kinds of projects, sometimes you can make an emotional connection. As Sean student had an emotional connection with that, with that project and with that topic. And some of the kids had a real emotional connection. In fact, they were moved reading the stories about kids their own age who were suffering. They were moved by that. And writing the stories and essentially being in the, the shoes of these kids had an impact on them. And then creating content yourself, you take so much more ownership over the content. You care that much more if you create it as opposed to something where you're a passive recipient. So there are these sort of intangible benefits and values that can go well beyond sort of uh, mastering curriculum content. And I, you know, so I kind of would ask myself, am I making learning last? I know I'm covering the material. I know they're doing well. Um, but am I making learning last? Am I, am I making some sort of emotional connection that might, this might even stay with them for years, if not decades? That's, that's terrific, Tom. Um, and that's the student in that recording is Laura Nelson, right? Yes. Um, she, uh, a couple of years ago, got admitted to the PhD program in history and literature at Harvard University and is working with Jill Lepore there. So that's sort of a nice coda to, um, to that story. So hopefully what uh, people take away from this is that uh, um, Tom presented this framework for thinking about technology-related projects, uh, collect, relate, create, donate. Um, where students gather information about a project through a combination of teacher-provided resources and research. They collaborate to develop and deepen their understanding of that topic. They create some kind of performance of their understanding, um, and technology affords some incredible opportunities to create multimedia performances of their understanding. And then they think about how the audience of those projects can go beyond um, just the teacher's eyes or even just the classroom, but uh, other folks who can benefit from, from hearing these stories and seeing these resources. So hopefully these three projects bring those ideas alive. Um, what we want to talk about in the rest of our time is some of the resources that we have available to you um, to create these kinds of projects on your own. Um, so for those of you who are using McGraw-Hill history textbooks, um, we've had a partnership now with McGraw-Hill where in, where in many, many of their titles, uh, their, their ed tech teacher materials that are embedded in the online teacher guides. Um, so if you're looking within your textbooks, um, you'll see uh, some project ideas. The folks from McGraw-Hill developed a series of hands-on chapter projects. And what we did is create what we call technology extensions. Um, so the hands-on chapter projects uh, have lots of resources and materials. They have step-by-step -step instructions. They have rubrics. They have guidelines. Um, they have you know, sort of worksheets and reproducibles um, to help walk even kind of novice teachers through a hands-on project. And what we've tried to do um, is give some additional resources to help teachers say, well, if you wanted to go beyond um, a sort of analog world project here, if you wanted to do something um, digital or online, here's the resources that you need. So a pretty typical example here is in the, um, early American history exploring the Americas. There's an idea of creating an illustrated piece of historical fiction. And we give some suggestions for how to turn that into an online, um, an online picture book. So let me walk you through some of the resources that we have available in the, in the network's McGraw-Hill textbooks and then some things that we have that go beyond that. So every technology extension typically consists of four parts, um, and they all begin with why. Uh, so as Tom said at the beginning, we try to, as much as possible, have all of our learning resources be organized around these questions of how can technology be in the service of learning. Um, so this is a project about creating podcasts um, that narrate the beginning of World War II, um, just as many people from that era would have learned about the beginning of World War II uh, over the radio. Uh, and, but beyond that, we try to provide some justifications for why this particular technology would be useful, how it develops important historical thinking skills, critical thinking skills that we think are valuable. 
We then talk a little bit about how to get started with these tools. We usually direct people um, to one of a couple of websites that we have. Um, one is uh, a teaching history with technology site um, that has a whole bunch of resources that I'll show you in a little bit about how to get uh, started with technologies. Um, so for podcasts, we have a page with a series of podcast tools with some ideas about how you get started with podcasts. Um, so instead of uh, um, instead of a sort of step-by-step -step, uh, recipe cookbook kinds of things, we try to provide a bunch of resources that, that can help you build your capacity um, for flexibly incorporating technology in different ways. Um, we then have a series of project suggestions. So again, instead of sort of telling people exactly how to do things, we have some different ideas. This is we usually have a page or two of this. This is just the beginning of it for this one. Um, one project where we say, here's how we would organize people into groups, here are the kinds of prompts that we would give people, here are the kinds of challenges, here's not exactly how to do things, but here are some ideas um, that can prompt you and provoke you to start thinking about how you would develop your own project. Um, and then finally, for every technology extension, we have some ideas about assessments of rubrics and how you might think about evaluating student work. Um, we have, uh, at the beginning now, most of the McGraw-Hill textbooks that we've partnered with, we have some sort of general ideas um, for, uh, for supporting successful education technology projects. Here are generally kind of five ideas that we offer for those of you who are, who are thinking about starting some of your first technology projects, or even those of you who have done this for a while. Um, here are just some sort of general ideas that we think are, are valuable. Um, the first is that we always encourage teachers who are doing technology-based work to sort of think ahead and try to imagine what some of the problems and complexities would be. Um, projects usually unfold over multiple days, and so we encourage teachers to think about what would be the sort of pen and paper backup plan for any given day. Um, if your internet connection wasn't working on the research day, how could you use resources that are in the classroom or in the library? Um, if students are supposed to be doing multimedia development and the computers aren't accessible, how can they be doing pen and paper storyboarding and things like that? Um, Whenever um, teachers are developing projects, we encourage them to do as much of the project as possible, both seeing it through the teacher side and through the student side. Um, there's an art teacher at High Tech High, which is one of the best project-based learning schools in the country, um, who has been there since the founding, and, and he says one of the sort of critical one of the critical things that happens at High Tech High is that every time teachers create a project, they do it first. Um, and whenever you have a chance to see what student workflow looks like from their perspective, um, we learn an awful lot from that. Um, we encourage teachers and schools to adapt to local technology resources, but increasingly really trying to make sure that uh, limits on technology resources don't keep us from using technology. So, you know, in many, many school districts across the country, um, every kid is walking into the classroom in high school with a um, or nearly every kid is walking in with, a, with an internet-connected supercomputer in their pocket um, and thinking about how we can leverage those resources in addition to laptop carts that might be available or computer labs or resources that students have at home or other things like that. Um, we've generally found that even in the, even in the, in, even in the most under-resourced schools, um, the, the teachers that have been most successful in using technology with their students have basically had a commitment to helping students do technology-rich projects even if they don't have perfect access to technology, saying it would be, you know, we may not have a fair distribution of technology in our classroom, but what would be really unfair um, is, is not have challenging our students to take on these projects um, uh, because we don't have sort of perfect equality across that. We really encourage people to think about tackling these projects um, with a partner, um, to find, trying to find another teacher in your department, someone else who would be excited about doing these kinds of things with you. Um, it's much, much easier to develop a new project and a new set of ideas doing it with someone else. Um, and then remembering that the first time you try any of these things, it's going to be hard. Um, and there are always uh, you know, unexpected challenges that pop up. But as you do more and more with uh, technology, it gets easier. Um, many uh, educators find themselves going through a bit of an innovator's dip where, where things get harder for a bit and then it gets easier. Um, just about every, um, every technology extension that we have published points to two resources uh, that are on the web 
um, that Tom and I have helped create and curate. Um, one of them is the Best of History website, so that's at besthistorysites.net, um, and this is a catalog of uh, some of the best uh, history resources that are organized by topic. Um, the original architecture of the site basically maps uh, the history teaching trajectory of Tom and I, that pretty much as we would teach a new topic, we would gather a whole bunch of resources, um, and then ultimately actually involve our students in gathering these resources and giving them class extra credit for um, looking up new resources, annotating them, and rating them, and so forth. Um, so if you're diving into a new topic and are just trying to figure out what are some of the best resources that are out there, um, Best of History Websites is a great tool for that. Um, and then we have a second website, which is Teaching History with Technology. Um, and the way that Teaching History with Technology is organized um, is it's around um, the kinds of things that teachers would want to do. Um, so we say, I would want my students to, um, you, to create a presentation. I would want my students to create a podcast. I would want my students um, to have more formative assessment opportunities. Um, and every page on teaching history with technology is organized around um, providing teachers guidelines and resources and suggestions for how to go about um, using these new kinds of technology tools. So just about every technology extension sort of offers some general ideas about how to take a more traditional project and make it a technology rich one. Um, and then it points to historical content resources at besthistorysites.net. Um, and it points to uh, sort of technology usage resources at teaching history with technology or thwt.org. Um, there's another uh, resource that we have. Our main website is edtechteacher.org, and actually some of our technology extensions point towards that. Um, for those of you who uh, are using tablets, um, uh, Android tablets, iPads, or Chromebooks um, that have apps in them, we increasingly now have a set of resources that are sort of organized uh, around uh, apps by learning activity. So we would say, take something like, you know, helping my students main, uh, be more organized online. Um, and an app like Evernote might fall in there where we have um, a little summary of the app, we have how easy we think it is to use, how useful it is, what its cost, and then if you were to follow that learn more link, um, there are video tutorials, there are guidelines, there are example projects, there are a whole set of resources that are there um, to help you be successful in using those tools. Um, so once you have started sort of using some of the technology extensions to create projects that, that we think are exciting, the next thing to do might be to start creating more of your own projects that you're excited about. Um, and one of the best ways to do that is to look at innovative project examples from other folks. Um, so this is a new initiative we have at uh, edtechteacher.org slash innovative, um, where we've tried to curate what we think are some of the most exciting technology project examples in all different kinds of disciplines. So we have things that are at the secondary level, we have things that are specifically in history and social studies, but I would definitely encourage um, history teachers not just to limit themselves to exploring those pieces. Um, one of the things that I think Tom and I have both learned working with diverse sets of educators um, over the last uh, 10 years is that there's a ton to learn from people who teach things very, very differently from you. Um, scientists have very particular ways that they think about teaching observation. Um, and it turns out that some of those ideas for teaching observation can be incredibly useful, say, in, in doing analysis of art in history or doing analysis of other kinds of visual evidence. Um, there are elementary school teachers who have very thoughtful ways about organizing how they use classroom time um, that I think uh, increasingly history and, and secondary school teachers are realizing that they can learn from. Um, so I would encourage you as you're exploring the different ideas that teachers have out there not to limit yourself um, to, uh, to just your own discipline or just your own age level, but realize there's a lot to learn from people who are teaching all different kinds of age level, ages and levels. Um, if some of these things sound exciting to you, we have a few other additional resources that you might be interested in to hang out with us. So coming up in November, um, we have a, uh, uh, an EdTech Teacher iPad Summit that's coming up. So for those of you who are teaching with iPads in your classroom, um, this will be our fourth year in Boston um, where we gather a whole community of folks who are super excited about uh, 
the promise and potential of tablets and iPads in education. Um, this year we have Guy Kawasaki, who is one of Apple's chief evangelists um, when Steve Jobs uh, first uh, started the company a long time ago, um, coming to, to give one keynote address and I'll give the other. Uh, so it should be an exciting event and one that we're really excited to bring our teachers back to uh, year after year and, and hope you'll come and join us. If you're interested, you, if you Google it, Tech Teacher iPad Summit, you'll find it, but it's also at ettipad.org. Um, and uh, we have a second uh, event that we're hosting now in San Diego, which will be sort of three, three Ed Tech Teacher Summits underneath the same roof. Um, one about iPads, one about Google for Education, and one we're calling an Innovation Summit, which will be about um, maker spaces and agile classrooms and, and what we think of as some of the 3D printing, what we think of some of the most exciting future trends in education. Um, and that you could find um, either by Googling a Tech Teacher Summit um, or, or looking up ettsummit.org and we can make sure that we send all these links to you uh, afterwards. Um, let me just take one minute to, well, if, if all this is working, to give you a quick tour. Um, of a few of the sites that we talked about, um, thwt.org and then besthistorysites.net. Because I can show you the screenshot, but it's always good to see what they look like live. Um, so if you come to Best of History Websites, which is our uh, content site, um, there's a search bar here, which is really easy to look through and a set of our top pages. Um, but then you can see that we've organized history in a couple of big categories, ancient and biblical times, American, European, you go into American history. There's a whole set of resources there pretty much under kind of every, uh, um, every category that you find. If we wanted to go into um, some of the Gilded Age stuff that Tom was talking about, We'd see here some of the, the best Gilded Age websites that we've come across and, and used, um, organized there for you to go through. Um, and then in uh, teaching history with technology, again, we have a set of resources here. You can search for something in particular, but you might say, um, oh, I want my students to, to do more with discussion and collaboration. What ideas are out there? So we can look at collaborative writing or Google Docs or social networks or social bookmarking or blogging or wikis and so forth. Um, and then underneath any of these categories, like how would I use um, text chat tools um, in my classroom if we follow any one of those links, um, then it'll take us to a page which um, has some useful resources for us. You know, why would we go about thinking about doing it? What are some sample exercises? What are some good chat guidelines? Um, what are some resources that might be able to help us uh, do this? Um, how can we do it in Google Docs or in, or in other kinds of tools? Um, so, the, so thwt.org um, and besthistorysites.net are, are two sites that you might be interested um, in, in searching through and exploring. Um, so that's what we wanted to share with you all. Hopefully you got a little bit of a sense of how we think about um, uh, making sure that technology is in the service of learning, how we think about using Ben Schneiderman's Collect, Create, Relate, Donate framework to organize um, our projects. You've seen some examples of projects. You've seen some resources that you could find inside your McGraw-Hill uh, textbooks that could help uh, get you started in these directions. Um, and, uh, and hopefully those are some resources to inspire you and guide you to get going. Um, if you have uh, questions as you're going along, um, Tom and I are interested in responding and you can contact us through the techteacher.org website um, or we're both uh, on, on Twitter as well. Um, and, and if you search for us, we're probably the first people who pop up there. Um, so thanks so much to the McGraw-Hill folks for having us and we have a few minutes left so maybe we can see if, if folks have questions or or, or if there are other topics that we should discuss more. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to type in the question um, area on your toolbar right now. We do have a couple of minutes left if anyone has any questions for our presenters. I'll ask question, Tom, when, when teachers are getting started taking on uh, these challenges, sort of doing some of their first kind of technology rich projects, what are some, what are some pieces of advice um, that you would generically give to them as they're thinking about getting started? Sure, so when we're working with teachers, we often explain we work in this Monday, someday dichotomy. On the one hand, what we're doing is trying to build vision of what's possible. You saw Sean's assignments. Uh, Sean's, Sean's creative assignment and YouTube video, you saw 
for instance, the uh, the podcast. But these aren't necessarily projects that a teacher is going to delve into initially with technology. These are maybe someday. Someday I might realize uh, this type of, of innovative or creative project. Um, what can I do on Monday? So what we try to do is, is introduce in our workshops immediately some tools that are purposeful, that are aligned with educational goals, and tools that teachers can use right away. So for instance, uh, the first thing I do in most of my workshops is I uh, ask students to go to a Padlet wall. So I've set up a Padlet wall available at Padlet.com. It's essentially a digital corkboard. And what I ask the teachers to do is I ask the teachers uh, at Padlet.com. Uh, I've set up a wall for them. And what they do is they add their picture on the wall, they add their title on the wall, and I give them a, a prompt such as, I hope to learn dot, dot, dot in the workshop. And then very quickly, the teachers are adding their pictures, they're adding information about them. And uh, uh, what we're doing essentially is simulating the first day of class, or maybe that in that first week of class, where students, uh, where, where students are, are, are then providing information that could be helpful for the student to get to know them. So for instance, you have a picture of all of your students, and so now the next day in class, you now, rec you, you now know all their faces. You may provide them with a prompt that they respond to such as, hey, so what are my hopes for the year? Hey, how do I, you know, how do I learn best? How do you learn best? Respond to that. You, so you can provide any type of prompt or question and the kids can respond to that. So um, when, we, when we do this in a workshop, the teachers basically need no help from me whatsoever to contribute to the wall. So they, so they understand this is very easy to do. This is a, really a Monday activity, something they can walk in the next day and integrate. They also um, start to understand uh, how this aligns with a key goal, in, and that is getting to know your students, which is the foundation of building relationships. There is information that can be collected very quickly on a Padlet wall about what students know, think, feel, and understand that can help inform our teaching and help building those relationships. So um, one, uh, one idea is with a Padlet wall to use it for pre-assessment, um, to walk right into a classroom start of the day and what do you know about this topic? Like, hey, what do you know about Bolshevism? And students can then quickly respond and the teacher has a sense collectively of what the teachers know. Now, the teacher can ask that they put their names. They don't have to put their names. It's really up to the teacher. It is collective. Um, it is collaborative. And it's a way for the teacher to have a sense of what's the best entry point on this topic. Not knowing what kids know and understand about a topic, our entry point might not be connected, might, might not be aligned um, correctly with the student's knowledge and understanding of that particular topic. That's just one tool. There are others that we introduce, such as Socrative at Socrative.com, also available as, as an app, which can be used for polls and surveys and also can be used for quizzes. And so um, often what I'll do with teachers early on is I'll push out a quick question. It'll just be um, uh, a multiple choice, whether it'll be an A, B, C, D, E, and I'll just give them a question. We'll simulate as if they're my students and I give them homework. And I'll ask them, huh, did you understand um, uh, the homework last night? How well? A, uh, extremely well. B, pretty well. C, half and half. D, mostly did not understand it. Or E, didn't understand it at all. Or, hey, how long did homework take you last night? A, might be 10 minutes. B, might be 20 minutes. C, 30 minutes. D, 40 minutes. E, more than that. So I'll just simulate, I'll push out uh, a, an anonymous quick question that's a true, false, a multiple choice or a short answer box, I'll ask them, okay, so um, could you please summarize in one sentence what you've learned to this point? In other words, I could push out a box and I could ask them any question. They could respond quickly. The prompt might be, hey, um, summarize last night's homework. Or, hey, what was the main idea of yesterday's lesson? Or it might be something, what questions do you have? How can I help you understand better? Uh, this is different than a Padlet wall because now what happens is the teacher sees all the responses but the students don't see each other responses. And hey, there are other problems. There's, there, there are other um, uh, programs here. 
there's Kahoot, um, which is very popular at Kahoot.it, which is a game-based program that can test for curriculum content. Where there's all sorts of uh, all sorts of history-related games that you could play, and it's a competitive, fun environment where kids are trying to answer as quickly as 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 they can. Once you play it once with kids, uh, especially younger kids, they're going to be asking you to play it all of the time. So these are some of the entry points. The, the idea is, hey, let's get to know our students better. Let's get to know what they know, think, feel, and understand. You might, in that first day of class, bring in a patented wall so you could get to know who they are, get to know their faces, names, a little bit about themselves. You could then use the padlet wall for pre-assessment. What do they know about a particular topic before you launch into it? Use uh, Socrative.com uh, as a way through uh, you know, a multiple choice, a true, false, a short answer, or quizzes, quizzes that can be graded too, um, of knowing what they know about curriculum content. So these, these are Monday tools. They're not, they're, you know, they're not particularly difficult. Um, it's the kind of thing that teachers can use them right away. But they are purposeful, they're useful, and they're aligned with a learning goal. So that's, that, that, that's, that's an example of an entry point for those who are looking to get started and want to do something that's not overwhelming, uh, that's practical, that's relevant, and hey, it's going to help them in their learning goals. That's great. So there's a whole bunch of resources that are relative to, relevant to those kinds of things, too, that are at, at edtechteacher.org. Um, so if you go to edtechteacher.org, you go to that How We Help section, um, there's a Start Here page, there's Innovative Project and Lessons, um, there's Tech Tools by Subject and Skills, um, so for any of these uh, kinds of things, and they're, and they're typically organized, as, as we've said, um, you know, some of them are organized by discipline, a lot of them are organized by topics and, and learning activities. I want my students to create timelines, I want to connect with other classrooms, I want to create portfolios. Uh, you know, a lot of what Tom is talking about is creating quizzes and student response systems. Um, so here are a whole set of tools that are there from Quia to Socrative to Poll Everywhere to Kahoot um, that, uh, that, um, that give people some resources for, for being able to do that. Um, and we, you know, link to those pages or link to other resources that we have related to that or all kinds of things. Um, so uh, uh, hopefully a lot of useful kinds of tools here to be able to help and guide you in the work that you're doing. Yeah, Justin, I would just add to this uh, to keep something in mind. It's better to do one thing well than five things mediocre. So um, I see some teachers who get excited about tools, want to introduce a lot of things, they want to introduce in all their sections, and they get a little bit overwhelmed. Um, and so I think it's important to always think about these tools within the prism of learning objectives. I mean, will this particular tool help me help students? And what are the ways that I want them to help students? If, if I'm a history teacher and I'm looking at Huh. Um, I want to develop their historical research skills. Well, then, then it might be time. It, it, it might be worthwhile to spending a little bit of time in Google Advanced Search and learning how to uh, search along uh, various syntax. In other words, being able to search uh, by country, being able to uh, be able to search by different domains, like search for just .edu materials, search for just .org materials. So spending a little bit of time in Google Advanced Search, it can help students use Google, which of course is their most popular research tool, use it more effectively. Hey, we could ban it, but that's, that, that, that really is not, uh, not an effective approach. Let's not ban, let's teach them how to use it more effectively so that uh, they're finding relevant and credible resources that can be used in various activities. So that's but one example of just identifying a goal and then sort of focusing on a tool and a strategy to develop it. Once, once you've identified the goals and identified a tool, then you can work with that to the point where, hey, I'm satisfied, I'm comfortable, I'm ready to move on to something else. So um, there's, there's no rush, there's no need to introduce all sorts of tools and all sorts of projects and activities at once. In fact, that's not desirable. Um, and I've seen too many teachers who try to do too much and become a little bit overwhelmed. And there are on some unanticipated issues or problems that that uh, uh, develop. So it's really important to hey, what are what are my principal learning goals? What might be a tool or tool that'll help me reach my learning goals? 
let me focus on that tool or two for now. Let me work on it for an extended period of time. Let me develop some best practices. Let me talk to my colleagues about using the tool. Let me maybe go online and go to edtechteacher.org, McGraw-Hill, other resources, find out some, some ideas. And when I've developed that measure of comfort and confidence um, that I'm using technology effectively in this, in this particular situation, now I'm ready to move on to something else. Um, so I find it's best to work gradually, purposely, and systematically than to, 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 to launch, you know, to launch into the uh, whatever next cool tool. Um, it's, it's too easy to be drawn in by a tool that seems really cool and, hey, my kids will really love it. I mean, that's great that they love it, but our principal role is not as amusement park directors. We are educators. So if the particular tool does not align with an educational objective, why even introduce it if it's just for amusement? So it's too easy to get caught up into the next cool tool. It's, it's harder but more purposeful, more beneficial to take a step backwards and say, what do I want my students to do? What are the key learning goals? Identify some tools that will help them. I, uh, then start to develop some strategies, collaborate, discuss with others, look at some online resources, uh, develop some practices, and then move on to something else. Terrific, Tom. Well, we're super grateful to you all for joining us today. I'm very grateful to McGraw-Hill for having us and for this collaboration that we've had with them um, over the last few years around these textbooks um, and other resources. And we hope that you found this uh, conversation helpful. And we hope you found that the resources that we've worked together with McGraw-Hill to create to be helpful. So, so thanks so much for having us and for being with us today. All right. Thank you, uh, Tom and Justin, for all of that. And thanks to everyone for attending this afternoon. Attendees will receive an email with a link to the recording of this session uh, in a day or so. And as you exit the webinar today, a survey will open. And we would appreciate your feedback to help us improve and plan future webinars. And if we did not get to a question that you had asked today, we'll follow up with you individually. Thanks again.